honorable members of that, the chief guest of this evening, Professor S. Ramachandram Garu, Vice Chancellor of Osmania University, Chairman of the Institute of Engineers, Satinara Garu, Principal at GIT, Chandramohan Reddy Garu, Professor Sur Suresh Garu, the Secretary of the Institute of Engineers and uh, <coughs> eminent engineers in the audience and uh, my fellow engineers, good evening. It's always been a great pleasure to be here and for me it's a great honor. Last time I was here I was explaining my connection and why I was named so and so after Vishweshwaraya. But the same gentleman who was a freedom fighter, he was of the opinion that during the early days of freedom, when they were fighting for independence, it was extremely important to maintain peace. So policemen were very, very important. So anybody pursuing IPS were highly respected those days. Not anymore, policemen are not so respected today as those days. Then after that, law and order was important. So lawyers were very, very important for the country. And those days, lawyers and judges were very respected. I do not think they are so respected today. After that, <coughs> administration was very important. So IAS officers were ultimate, at the extreme of respect to be a ICS those days or a IAS officer. After law and after administration, then came issues like healthcare, doctors were respected. Some of them are still respected. After that, teachers and professors are respected because that's what the nation needed. Then after that, it is the engineers who build the country and those were required and those are required today. And that is why the very same gentleman he had, who happens to be my grandfather, all his elder children were either, uh, elder family members were either in the police those days or lawyers and judges like my father. Subsequently, my uncles and aunts were teachers and professors and later doctors and the youngest in my family being me, he told you should be an engineer and uh, you should be your teacher. And I think that future we have come here and this is the days of the engineers, this is the days that engineers will win nations and states and the world. And engineers will solve the problem of climate change and poverty and education and healthcare, not the IAS officers, not the police officers. And that is what that great old man foresaw. And, uh, and uh, definitely it was his inspiration that I am here today for you. It was a true feeling and of course his greatest plan, he also said that uh, my greatest plan, him being a politician, while I have great admiration for Nehruji, I am the greatest, not the greatest fan of Nehruji, I am the greatest fan of Moksha Gunnam Vishweshwaraya and he saw that he is the person of the future. Engineers. Have a responsibility, but they also have great capability today than ever before to solve all these global problems, not just solve engineering problems, to also solve social problems. And innovation is the crux of finding the solutions to these problems that the world, the nation, and the state is facing. They said necessity is the mother of invention, but I never fully understood, and I still don't understand that very well. But one thing I know, it is not necessary to be. If you encounter problems, if you are surrounded by problems, if you are immersed in problems, if you are able to understand the problem, then you start finding solutions. So it's understanding immersion of the, into the problem is what fosters, in, fosters innovation. I would like to 
touch upon various subjects relating to innovation. Some of it is a little boring. We take that in the parliament. There are various patent laws in our countries. And uh, most of you know, we stand at the bottom in terms of innovation. Our patent laws were very, very uh, poor. And uh, there were hardly any patent examiners. And uh, average patent would take seven or eight years. And the patent itself will last about 20 years. Any patent, you get the award of the patent when it's just about to expire. And uh, long time back, I had uh, filed to this almost 30 years back. And I think I still didn't get it, I did not pursue it. But uh, after the changes in the patent law, because of WTO and uh, global influence of West and the globalization of the world, the patent clause in India became compatible with the patent clause across other countries. And uh, now the system is much better, but still there are many, many problems in the patenting. But innovation is not just patenting. It is patenting, it is copyrights, it is trademarks, it is geographical indi indications, as Mr. Satyanara uh, Garu mentioned about neem or uh, uh, turmeric or basmati, these are geographical indi indications. And uh, they are also, innovation also, some of it is kept secret, so they are also trade secrets. I will also go through briefly what you keep as trade secrets and what you keep as patenting. Once you patent, it become public knowledge. So many, many uh, companies prefer to keep them as trade secret for certain things. And you will find some of these are interesting and I will go to that. But before that, let me touch on the, my, one of my favorite subjects uh, which I was working on. I was fascinated with solar energy from childhood. Okay. I have a small presentation here and some slides. So, solar energy, I think the slide there you see is a concentrating solar power. These are huge mirrors. The length of the mirror or the row of mirrors approximately half kilometer to one kilometer and the parallel with the sun. At the center focal point is a tube and the temperature there reaches about 300 to 450 degrees and uh, that heat is used to create steam either directly or indirectly. They heat the oil and then uh, the oil is, uh, the heated oil then uh, uh, then boils the water in the boiler and runs the turbine and generates electricity just much like a thermal power plant. Now the, each uh, kilo megawatt of this used to cost about 17, 18 crores, now it costs about 11, 12 crores concentrating. And these are much more efficient than the photovoltaic, photovoltaic power plants. The high technology component, one is it's a, just a mirror, it's a high efficiency mirror which reflects 94% as opposed to normal mirrors we use which is 80%. In the center of that there is a tube which where the oil or the water flows. That's where it becomes 400 degrees. So this tube is actually like a thermos flask. If it can accumulate heat, it can also radiate heat. So that tube is a metallic tube. Outside it is a glass shield. Between the metallic shield and the glass there is a vacuum. Because like a vacuum, it should not it should hold the temperature just like the vacuum glass. Now there is no single tube, glass tube which is one kilometer long. It's made up of many small components. Edge of it is a metallic cap. And then each one is connected to the other in series. The center tube you see there. Now this is a really, really, really high tech equipment. About if the whole power plant costs about uh, 13, 14 crores, just these tubes cost about 4 crores or three or four pros, just this glass tube. And uh, we tried making this particular tubes. This was a failed experiment. It's really too high tech, which we tried here in Hyderabad. So, the problem here is when you mold a metallic cap into the glass, the metal has a different thermal coefficient of expansion, it expands and contracts in a different way, and a glass expands and contracts in a different way, so what happens is the glass is enclosed in the metal and the, the temperature in the night changes from 0 degrees to morning in an afternoon 400 degrees. One will expand faster than the other and the glass starts cracking. Right? Nobody, Americans couldn't find, Germans couldn't find, all the researchers in the world couldn't find. There is only one company 
in Germany and one company in, uh, uh, in Italy could find this. What same way the glass X, the thermal coefficient of expansion curves are same as the thermal coefficient of expansion of the glass. So the same, if this expands, that also expands equally and contracts. So the glass doesn't come. So the glass doesn't crack. Now are the, Ger are the Germans and the Italians so much more better than the Americans and the Japanese and the uh, UK people? All are smart. All have invested heavily in research. Why do these guys succeed? That is actually the receiver too. The metal caps at the end. Okay. Why did they succeed? Go to the next. We went to Salachan Museum, you see some of these. And these are all made in Italy or Germany. These are beautiful chandeliers. Right? So in Italy and Germany they used to make chandeliers that glass covered like this, where you put a candle in the middle and the bottom is a steel ring. A metallic ring. Chandeliers those days also had the same problem. When the candle goes down and where the glass holds the, uh, the metal holds the glass, it used to crack. So they solved those problems not because of science, because in those days glass blowing was not engineering. They used to be either father and son and uh, to grandson, they used to be glass blowers and chandelier makers, but more so it was the medieval ages. The apprenticeship system became very popular. So through the apprenticeship system, the engineering they problem they find today, they found those days while making chandeliers. And if the Italians and Germans, through the apprenticeship system, have encountered the same problem and found a solution of this of this uh, alloy which has the same thermal coefficient of expansion, they extended that knowledge and made this modern high tech. <coughs> So, clearly, it was not through academic research. Clearly, those people were immersed in the problems. It's the apprenticeship system who were growing grass and they were doing grass. They encountered all these problems and they found a solution. Only those days, the temperature range was between uh, 100, uh, 200 degrees to maybe uh, 30 degrees or 20 degrees. Here, the temperature and range was there. This is what most of the countries which innovate, you see, whether it's UK, Germany, Italy, Japan, they have an unbroken apprenticeship system from the Middle Ages to now. India is the only country where we lost the apprenticeship system was broken in the middle. And, uh, the, and the new apprenticeship system which some of the uh, skills development ministry are trying to implement are just not in place. And that is why India was a highly innovative, uh, innovative country in the ancient times and now we are at the bottom of the list in the innovation. If you look at, uh, if you look at uh, any economy, <coughs> it's the value of innovation that comes today. Before it was how much uh, uh, ores you have, how much agriculture you have, but it is today how much innovation. So if you take various graphs, Innovation versus unemployment, number of patents versus unemployment, number of patents per capita versus per, per capita income, and various other parameters. I think uh, there's a clear distinction between development, positive development, and innovation. And India, clearly, we are lacking or lacking in that. So, so what is the value of this idea? Just this intellectual property or innovation, what we call it. Just take an example of, uh, in the olden days, we have Ittadi Bindalu, copper or brass Bindalu or Max, right? And the value of the Ittadi Bindalu used to be the value of the weight of the material. Plus, the labor cost, there was hardly any value to the design cost. By contrast, by contrast, if you take today's any piece and the plastic inside may cost, the cost of the material is less. The cost of manufacturing is more and the cost of design also is more. If you take my, our cell phones, what you have, it may cost 10,000 to 40,000 rupees. Now, what's the cost of the material there? It's a little bit of sand converted to silicon, little bit of metal converted to this. The cost of all the material is probably less than uh, 50 or 100 rupees. 
the cost of manufacturing may be 1000 or 2000 rupees in the 40000 rupee phone the cost of ipr intellectual property in that phone is 90% so almost everything if i take this shirt also probably the cost the cost of the shirt the cost of the cotton material is less it's the work and the design has more work more value to it so it is the innovation that creates jobs the innovation that creates value innovation that creates economy today and uh, past innovations satyanam garu mentioned some of those the name the designs of various materials <coughs> used in yagams and yoga and all that the ayurvedic ayurvedic medicines the mathematics but one thing that really stuck there's also you know uh, in coimbatore i went to a uh, modern uh, modern metallurgy still has a founding many stories whether you see the ashoka pillar in the delhi or in coimbatore i saw shivalingam it is 99% lead uh, sorry 99% mercury which is liquid but it is solid modern chemistry has not found a solution but we can see those one standing in delhi one standing in coimbatore there are many things that are but what struck me phenomenally was about our cows and our milk <coughs> a1 and a2 incidentally in the, in the milk there is uh, proteins and there are various types of proteins one of them is uh, beta casein protein which is what the curds and the hard materials made of or the cheese or curds or the paneer that the beta casein now there are two types of them which modern science discovered only about 10 15 years ago a1 and a2 now some cows some breeds of cows predominantly give a1 beta casein some predominantly give a2 now those who have lactose intolerance most is because of the and when they shift to a2 it goes off but some people have on a2 also but further research they found that people who drink a1 type of milk are prone to various kinds of autoimmune diseases including diabetes arthritis or and uh, also heart diseases and people who drink a2 milk are not so prone to that that's the healthy type of milk and in india we have various types of cows saiwal ghee rongol malvi mumbai cherry various kinds of indian cows and buffaloes and abroad also in switzerland germany uk usa we have various holstein <coughs> jersey angus swiss texas longhorn various kinds of Uh, cows in the uh, also innovation they are not infringing on anything they have taken a knowledge they have got that and this is a great opportunity for us <coughs> now in india the cumulative total number of patents in india since independence till now divided by the population it is 17 patents per million yeah. and uh, in japan it is 3000 and the usa is uh, almost 1000 and south korea is 4500 but there's one company the guys who make samsung and all that one company has more patent than entire india <laughs> so so that is how bad we are and i think uh, we are but I, i don't believe we are not innovative we are inventing various things one of the things in engineering why that gap came in engineering is all of us are aware of it as educationists as engineers there is a huge gap between practical and theory in india which was bridged by the accreditation system in other places which was broken in india and uh, now we are inventing probably various ways and nowadays they say in the internet the most fresh of the thing is how to convert something very black into something very white they are inventing very very many many different ways and i am sure we are going to be very innovative over that but it is not just how to invent things in fact a patent is of no use to society one of the things the various criteria if for example a patent can be used to kill million people i cannot patent it in most countries like different sites cannot be patented in india and us and this thing some countries allow that and almost all the country the basic fundamental thing patent it, it's patent and it is of no use to the society it cannot be patented for example i cannot uh, patent a helmet for a rat it is of no use to society 
It's probably for amusement of a children, but no. So there are various criteria for identity, and this is one of the criteria. It is primarily for the benefit of society, benefit of society, benefit of the of the inventor. Also. How does the inventor or the company that owns the invention benefit? That is the art and science by itself. And I give the example of uh, Gillette. And uh, before that, uh, you know, my early patents just expired. I think that because the patent was was like that. And now I have a full-time uh, patent lawyer in my company. He's sitting here, Mr. Sandeep Reddy. And uh, uh, world over companies have strategies of how to milk the patent, how to make the maximum out of patent. How to do defensive patenting? How so that you can't infringe on my patent? So I have a patent and I made it all rounded, so like a wall. So if you try to infringe on that, you'll you'll probably copy the outer ring but not the main product itself. There's also what is called as evergreen patenting. If I have a large idea, I'll break it down into small, small ideas because patent lasts only 20 years. So first I'll patent this. 19th year I'll patent this. And after 29th year I'll patent this. So that some come after that one when I used this, it was really, really smooth. I thought not, no blade on the earth can be smoother than this. <laughs> then they launched that, this one. This was even more smoother. <laughs> and I wondered how can something be smoother than the smoothest thing on earth. After that, they launched that, 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 and finally we have this. Right? No one could, every time you do this thing, how can you beat the best? And how can you better yourself? But they have done it. They have done it. And they have, and this is now the latest high tech one. This is the latest high tech one. And uh, in each one of them, there are several patents. And they patented it all over the world and in India. Last time, that patent lawyer was in Bombay. And I didn't know that, that he was in the audience and he stood up and spoke. So we know. So if you are a blade manufacturer, what do you? To itself, how to make the blade very, very sharp. Right? Of course, at the end of the day, if your company you also want to sell it, right? So it's also great advertising. Some good looking models there with shaving guys. It's also great advertising. Next. And then you have this, this uh, superstar product which is going to make the company some seven or eight billions of dollars every quarter. So that is so what's the story behind it? If you are a blade manufacturer, you are designing a blade, you want to make the blade the sharpest, right? But if you make the blade sharp, that is a long time. We should also become a billionaire? No. Right? If we can make it sharper than Gillette and stays longer, we should also be billionaire? That would not, I, I would have imagined. But apparently not. Wilkinson was a company who made it as sharp and still remains long like that. But here's where the ingenuity of patenting and trade, where do you use patenting and innovation uh, for patenting and where do you do trade secrets? Go next. But usually any blade starts becoming dim, uh, becoming blunt over a period of time as you can see in the graph. Right? But here's the innovation of here's the innovation of Gillette. For exactly four weeks it remains very sharp. And then in the next three days, the, it suddenly becomes dull. So how it remains sharp is a is a patented technology. How it remains, how it should become dull, uh, blunt in three days, next three days is a trade secret. Because unless it becomes dull, you want by the next blade, right? So and they have perfected this art. And just like I think you heard of Baba Baba Ramdev telling. Uh, Coke has uh, more sugar here than in uh, other countries, it's more harmful here. They tailor make the market for each country, depending on the taste, paying capacity, everything. Now Gillette can make, they can not only make it sharp after four weeks, they can also make it sharp after one week. What is the paying capacity of this market? How long will the market tolerate the same product? Uh, when will they be uh, willing to change? And then. And then they change 
the time period of how fast it becomes blur, whether after one week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. So whenever I carry, India is a poor country, so gillette plates here have a longer duration and then they suddenly fall. So I never ever buy gillette plates. Okay. By the way, I don't have proof of this. It's only my suspicion. Okay. <laughs> it's only my suspicion. At uh, this, I have a little bit knowledge about this. But the next point I'm going to say is even more. Now, how does they manage that? Uh, I thought this. Before launching the new model, they start tinkering with these curves, sharpness curves, and make the older model blunter. Then when you put the new model, it becomes really, really sharp. <laughs> and uh, so this is how to milk. I mean, I hope nobody from Gillette is here and nobody is going to sue me. <laughs> but, uh, but actually on that day, the Gillette, uh, Gillette uh, lawyer was in the crowd. <laughs> So uh, how do you actually uh, do this? And that is, you know, how sophisticated patenting strategies and all this have become. And uh, but nevertheless, this phenomenal group for just plain good old understanding the problem and solving the sol and finding the solution. It is keeping our mind alive. Having an innovative mind. It doesn't mean we have to invent new things. It's trying to understand day to day problems, trying to find solutions to day to day problems, questioning everything, questioning why is our policies like this, questioning the government, are we spending too much money here and too little money there, questioning the governments. This is what I innovate. And uh, the patent which I recently got, which was, it's a it's a patient transfer system. Even today in the United States, say in the best hospital you go, you want to ship the patient. Three people stand this side of the bed, three people on the other side, lift and put them there. While they have the highest of the technology in uh, lasers, phasers, ultrasound, CAT scan, MRIs and all, patient transfer itself is is very primitive way. And uh, this is how it works. It slides under that and picks him up. And uh, they are actually here. So, and in our education system also, we teach them and they accumulate knowledge, but it doesn't instigate thought or questioning in there. And as an electrical engineer, I think so far in my career, in various companies I work and in my own companies I work, I would have, I estimate, I would have interviewed at least about five, 6,000 engineers so far in the last 30 years. So, I am 56 by the way. And uh, one of the questions, I is this an electrical or electronic engineer, one of the questions or any engineer I used to ask is, uh, what is voltage and current? And what is V equals IR? Voltage equals current into resistance. Everybody knows, 100% knows. And uh, V equals IR can be so I equals V by R or R equals V by I. But that is not engineering, that is uh, algebra. The equation you are just manipulating. So the next simple question I ask is, is it because of voltage there is current and resistance? Or is it because there is current, uh, is it because of current there is voltage and resistance? Or is it because of resistance there is current and this thing? You will not believe including IITs. IITs have a little better chance, but the average correct answer was less than 5%. So, even I was not taught, it is much later when you question yourself, you kind of start. So, we need to give ourselves an opportunity to this thing and some of us get that opportunity to question. But, uh, there is something else which is bothering me significantly as an engineer, an engineer from India, it is bothering me even more. And I seek your help and those questions are there in my mind and I am presenting it not as an expert, as somebody who has seen this and this is where I need all your help, this is where I want all of you to think and this is the subject I was most fascinated since uh, my childhood and uh, I am extremely serious about this, I have raised in the parliament on this subject I am the most unpopular person if I go to a party or if I go in the parliament and speak about it 
or wherever I speak, and even to some engineers when I speak, I feel I am alone, isolated, and most unpopular. So I will put the facts before you. I want you to think about it, and I want you to help me if you think I am right. And if you think I am wrong, I definitely want you to help me correct myself. As I told you, uh, you know, one of the things I was fascinated from childhood in the when we were young, there were no color magazines. Right? There were no color magazines. I think Life magazine was there, Time magazine back then we used to get, and Illustrated Weekly yeah. was the only colored magazine. And we used to never get that because it was uh, in a house. So we used to get from American consulate one magazine called Span. And it has glossy this thing. And those days, I think I was probably in high school, we opened it and I read about this uh, solar energy from sun, actually you can generate power. So I was fascinated. And then they told me, your, your name is so and so and you have to become an engineer from childhood. I was even more fascinated from this. I never thought it was an imposition, I thought it was a something I liked. At that time, I think in a, 1968 or 69, the efficiency of a solar panel was 2%. And in the same article in Span, they said, in the future, it will be 7 or 8%. percent that time, it will start becoming commercially viable. Then I went to intermediate, it became 4%. I used to follow it throughout my life. Even now, I follow. Even today, before coming here, I looked at the latest one, uh, panels. And uh, then it became 2%, solar PV panels. When I was in inter, when I was in engineering, first or second year it became seven, eight percent. But then they told because the cost of manufacturing is so high, when it reaches nine or ten percent, it will become commercially viable. Then end of engineering it became eight percent. Then after it, with Indian ancient Indian culinary arts, where it cooks from inside to outside, how the hell is it possible? It bothered me. I ate, I still enjoy it. I ate it yesterday. And uh, it's still my favorite uh, Ajmeri Kalakan, it's called. One is the white one. Yeah. Other is inside it is cooked and outside it's not. How the hell? And I discovered the answer after, I think after 20 or 30 years of mystery, I discovered the answer about uh, seven, eight years back. And uh, this is same as white Kalakan, but uh, this has a very milk. Uh, the, the uh, total solid elements in the milk, including fat, are here. The way it is taken off. So it is like what Americans call cheese, the color. And this has a very, very high heat capacity, higher than all the metals or higher than the bricks and all that. It has a very, very high heat capacity. So they heat it up, separate the whey, whey which is the water that comes out of the paneer, and then this is a koa like material. They take it, and you have to see how they make this very color. So they take, so it's floating in the water, they dip their hands in cold water, take out the floating this thing and make it into a uh, ball with the hands. And it is still very, very hot and it has a very high heat capacity. So then they make it a ball and pack it. Then the inside is covered with the outer layers, or the inside gets the hottest because the outside is cooled by the air. The inside, there is no way to, for the heat to escape and the outside layer heat also goes to the inside. So the inside gets cooked well and then the outside is starts getting cooled. That's why if you notice, the inside is brown, it is more cooked than the outside. So this was one of the puzzles and I feel very proud of me understanding this as, as much as an invention. So, uh, we had all these innovation cooking techniques and all this in the past. And uh, my firm belief is we should constantly have a questioning mind. We should question everything. And uh, we should not uh, take anything for granted. Whether Prime Minister Modi says it's good, or any minister, or any scientist. Incidentally, I met uh, the advisor. I was in UK. I went to the UK four days back. What was his name? He is a very eminent scientist. Uh, he is the advisor in UK to the UK government. Now he is the advisor to Modi ji. And I think while he is eminent scientist promoting solar energy, I also feel he is driving us in the wrong direction. I am forgetting this name. 
So I think we need to look at, uh, that is what engineers are. We take facts, we analyze them, <coughs> and come to conclusion. Not magazines or others' opinions. And uh, uh, as uh, others' opinion. And uh, I think uh, these are extremely important for us. It is this that made Einstein great. It is this that made uh, Steve Jobs or any of the inventors. They did not start out to create a nuclear bomb. They went on an incremental way. And they had a questioning mind. And these are some of the things that we should question everything and anything. The only problem is, especially in our system and our education, and that's why I have no patents in electrical engineering. Also, I, although I was a design engineer in an aerospace company in the United States, because we take knowledge as it is and uh, we don't question. When I go into mechanical engineering or other fields, I start questioning and learn for the basics. And I think that, that is something that we need to foster a questioning mind. And uh, Coming back to coming back to the issue of uh, what is really good for a country, whether it's engineers, and these are the days of the engineers today will solve most of the problems. Is definitely engineering in all fields, whether it's medicine or agriculture, or in every every field, it is engineering is the solution. My current work is on biogas and I feel that is a potential solution for India. We produce enough oil to stop imports of all cooking gas. Stop imports if you run vehicles on the CAT vehicles can be run on biogas. There are some Mahindra and Mahindra vehicles. And uh, all the heavy vehicles can run on biogas now. And these are the areas of my current research. And, uh, after literally having burnt on solar. Incidentally, I'm not just talking against solar. I also, as a businessman, I bid for Jawaharlal National, JNN, Jawaharlal National Mission for Solar Energy. We bid for this. We were allocated 200 acres of land. And then I returned the entire amount uh, of land back to the government. Many people have not even returned the land back to the government. They are not doing solar, but they have a 91 to the land thousands of acres. We had 200 acres in Anandpur. I returned it back because I realized when I got into the depth of it, my pay, I have some patent spending on solar thermal, but not on this. And when I got to the depth of it, solar photovoltaic energy is going to do great harm. I withdrew from it and I returned the land back to the government. Usually when some government allocates land, nobody returns the land back. So, as I stand here, as an engineer who turned into a politician against the wishes of my grandfather, I really wonder whether I went forward or whether I went backward. Because he was a person who told everyone, don't ever enter politics. Especially if you want to do race seva, then definitely do not enter politics. <laughs> If you want to do this, there were those days during the time of independence, I am required and there. He was a pre-independence politician who went after independence. But he, he advised each and every one of his children, don't enter politics, especially you want to do this, Seva. Become a doctor, lawyer, teacher, or the younger people, engineer. And he made me. And then, now I ended up being a politician. So I really don't know whether I came forward or went backward. But definitely, uh, meeting here gives me much more greater honor than the greatest of the politicians will give me. And definitely, <laughs> or maybe it's a time we have come a full circle, then maybe all of you also should be in politics for a better India and a better future. This recognition definitely means more for me, and thank you for the opportunity.